Welcome, welcome everyone to This Is How We Win, a movement rally where we are going to share breaking huge news in this deadly exchange campaign and talk about how we're going to celebrate and escalate from this moment. Um, before we get started with our program tonight, um, there is live captioning available in the Google Doc that is shared in the chat. Um, and I want to welcome everyone tonight. We have a lot to share because last week, a leaked memo from inside the Anti-Defamation League, dated from June of 2020, reveals that our movements have forced this organization to stop their deadly militarizing U.S.-Israel police exchange programs for the past three years. And in that memo, they also admit that they knew the program was likely militarizing the police, and they demonstrate beyond a shadow of a doubt that the collective power of our unstoppable coalitions has caused massive internal crisis. In this memo, the top execs recommend ending the U.S.-Israel police exchanges that we have been fighting for the past five years, and now, when asked for comment by the media, the ADL is doubling down, no surprise, on their commitment to police and apartheid Israel. So I want to take a minute to talk about why this victory matters. What does this memo show us? And then we are going to go into a gorgeous array of hearing from amazing movement leaders who are, have laid the groundwork and made this moment happen for decades and the past many years. Um, what does the memo show us? It shows us that the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, has been attacking Black and Palestinian and anti-Zionist Jewish organizers for decades while telling us we don't have impact pretending our organizing doesn't matter, insisting that we are marginal and slandering us as anti-Semitic. When in fact, the united front that we have created and organized inside of has forced this $93 million organization into a corner. This program was their banner program. They had it in the center of their annual reports in the middle of their website, and they were forced to stop it for three years because the power of our united front pushed them against the ropes. And we are here tonight because we have to take a minute to acknowledge, to honor, to celebrate the real, real huge power that our movements have when we come together and fight for collective liberation. So we're gonna take a moment to celebrate. You're gonna hear from some of the, the organizers on this planet that I admire the most um, who have made this moment happen. In just a few minutes, we're gonna start hearing. Um, the memo also shows us that the ADL was publicly smearing Everyone is anti-Semitic. Everyone you'll hear on this call has been smeared as anti-Semitic by the Anti-Defamation anti League while internally questioning the program themselves. Their base hypocrisy has never been more obvious. We are here tonight because we have to see the ADL smears as what they are. Craven attempts to take down our movements and defend Israel from accountability for decades of human rights abuses. And finally, this moment reminds us that we cannot let up. If we recognize the power of our unified, united front, we can once and for all end the ADL's fake reputation as a so-called civil rights organization, and we can also end all police exchange programs everywhere. Um, so let's get to it. Let's celebrate. Let's escalate. And now I am so glad to introduce the wonderful Rabbi Linda Holtzman from the JVP, Jewish Voice for Peace Rabbinical Council, to bless this moment with us. Linda. Thank you, Stephanie. It's wonderful to be here to give a blessing. So when we look at Torah, when we look at Hebrew scriptures, we see one interesting command in the middle. Sedek. Sedek, Tirdof, justice, justice, you shall pursue. It's very unusual in Torah to have a word repeated, but yet we're told justice, justice, pursue. And it's also unusual to be told to pursue anything, but justice, that's our command. Chase it down. Create it, even if it's not obvious from the start. So right now, we are at a place where we have pursued justice, the first justice. We have brought to light the deadly exchange. We've brought to light the ways that the Anti-Defamation League has brought the worst practices of the Israeli military, of Israeli policing, to the United States. 
and built on the racism and violence and cruelty that is already a part of American policing. The first tzedek, the first word justice, is a command to open our eyes and not let anything stop us from seeing the truth. We cannot let preconceptions, we cannot let lies ever block our vision. When the ADL claims to stand up against all hate, we know that we cannot take them at their word. And we have not done that. We opened our eyes to the truth and the power of our vision, the vision of the racism and violence and cruelty we saw forced us to pursue justice, to act. JVP and so many organizations acted. And tonight, tonight we celebrate that we made a real difference. Tonight, we celebrate the pause that the ADL was forced to take because of us. So we have pursued justice, the first word, tzedek, but now we are not finished because the word is repeated. The second time the word tzedek is spoken is a command to us to stay in pursuit. Tzedek, tzedek, tirdof. Justice, justice, pursue. This is the more challenging pursuit, since the temptation after so much work is to pause and celebrate and just be. But we know, we know the ADL is not going to suddenly turn into a just, honest organization. We know that they will continue the racist militarism they have long embraced. And tonight, we both celebrate and then make a commitment to stand up to end this program and all of the awful work, awful work that the ADL does permanently. That's our second pursuit. And we are determined to obey that command. Sedek, Sedek, Tirdof, Sedek, Sedek, Nirdof, justice, justice, we will pursue tirelessly to bring it about whenever possible. Thank you so much, Rabbi Linda. Um, and I am honored also to turn it over to Jewish Voice for Peace's Director of Campaigns and Partnerships and a dear friend and comrade of mine who is perhaps new to that particular role, but not at all new to this campaign as an esteemed researcher and actually the author of the Deadly Exchange Report that came out in 2018. Um, it has, we have been long in this fight together and it is wonderful to be here tonight with you, Iran. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It's an honor to be in this fight with you and it's inspiring to be with you all tonight. I've been waiting for this evening for many years, right? If you me and you know me from across this campaign you know I was waiting to be with you all to celebrate tonight together but also to escalate right because we are not done what this memo Stephanie is talking about shows the world is what our movement knew all along right that the ADL is invested in the militarization of police and in the US Israeli military industrial complex the combined military complex these trips were designed from the beginning to upload the shared values and mission of the so-called war on terror. I have met, I have talked with those officers who returned from the deadly exchanges and I've studied what they learned in Israel. In many ways, Israel is the past and the future of the United States. It is a, a brutal settler colonial estate and offering a future of all-encompassing surveillance technology and repression that Palestinians know all too well. I saw the destruction and pain inflicted by the Israeli apartheid regime, the Israeli military, the Israeli police, the Shin Bet, all of which the American officers meet when they travel to Palestine. I know what the occupation tactics look like and what they can teach. Israeli offensives on the Gaza Strip or all across Palestine 
are not only war crimes. They have afterlives in American policing, and they must be stopped. In the last decade, I traveled community by community between towns and universities um, and organized with some of the most inspiring, brilliant, and courageous activists across the country. I met you, right? And you knew that only when our movements come together, resist together, build together, we only fight, but we win. We have protests in the streets and in front of ADL offices. We successfully passed local legislation in Durham, in New Orleans, in South, in Northeastern. We also passed legislation just this fall in Seattle, and we're not done there quite yet. The memo names the campaign itself over five times, and it makes it absolutely clear that our fight, this is big. We have the ADL right now on their knees, not done once and for all. And we start with Omar Bauguti of the Palestinian National Committee. And the ADL is stuck, doomed if it persists in its deadly exchange, and doomed if it desists. If it insists on growing its invarism that such training aggravates, its true nature align the power of the DA in justice to black indigenous that should entirely lift its already worn mask, and that in turn will help to further unmask Israel's apartheid regime's true face. We need to remind ourselves that Palestinians are calling for ending international state, corporate, and institutional complicity in Israel's regime of military occupation as well. Israel, through sale of weapons, training, and other forms of support, has for decades been a culprit in war crimes and crimes against humanity perpetrated by dictatorships, death squads, and authoritarian regimes worldwide, from Latin America to Africa to South Asia, often on behalf of U.S. imperialism, but lately independently of it. As a recent New York Times investigative report has shown, Israel has used its web votes to play a leading role as well in the exchange campaign, brilliantly led by JVP, the Movement for Black Lives. Oh, so lovely to hear from Omar. Thank you so much, Omar. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce Kareem Peterson Smith, the Michael Ratner Middle East Fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies. Researches and writes about U.S. militarism, Israeli apartheid, and the Palestinian freedom struggle. And I cannot emphasize enough how much his writing, his research, and his organizing has been incredibly influential in shaping the campaign, both laying the groundwork, partnering with us throughout it, and um, leading us forward from here. Korea, it is an absolute honor to throw it to you. It is an absolute honor to join this incredible space in this amazing celebration. And as we celebrate and as we escalate, I am reminded of the words of the incredible Black revolutionary freedom fighter, Asada Shakur, when she said, a wall is just a wall and nothing more at all. It can be broken down. We know all the walls that are erected against Palestinian folks, all the walls that are erected against black folks in this country and around the world, all the walls that are erected against migrants, against so many people who are marginalized, who are oppressed. Those walls are real, those walls are violent, and yet they can be broken down. We have been breaking down those walls in conversation, so we are having an entirely different conversation about Palestine and Palestinian freedom and Israeli apartheid in this country than in years past. And yet, in the face of that changing conversation, organizations like the Anti-Defamation League, they say they're not changing. They say that they're steadfast in their commitment to Israeli apartheid. And yet, Behind closed doors, there are cracks appearing in those walls. They will not admit it, they have not admitted it, but those cracks are real, they are happening. 
the reason why uh, the pause in these programs has taken place is needed upon Palestinians and upon our communities here by the programs that they facilitate for years. So they are aware it is not a change of heart. It is because, because there is a power that has been mobilized. And let us remember that this memo that was exposed was written in, in the summer of 2020, a summer of Black-led revolt in this country. Um, let's remember what that revolt achieved. Let's remember that we faced a president in the White House who was talking about deploying the military to quell our resistance. Let's remember the level of brutality from the police across the country uh, against our rebellions. And yet, let us also remember that in cities like Los Angeles, we forced budgets to be changed to say, we need you to invest in human needs and not in the police. Let us remember all of the Confederate statues that came down that summer. Finally, after years and years, years of, of campaigning. campaigning. Let us remember, remember places, places like, like Tulsa, Tulsa Oklahoma, Oklahoma, where there, where was, there was a massacre, massacre in 1921 that, that finally, finally was recognized. Was recognized. Uh, uh, finally, a century, a century later, later, the Tulsa, Tulsa massacre, massacre was recognized because, because of the of revolt, revolt of, uh, uh, that, that, that black led revolt in the summer of 2020. And I'm so proud that what we achieved went well beyond the black community. Let us remember that mascots, that caricature indigenous folks, the Washington football team, the Cleveland baseball team, finally, after years of campaigning, were forced to change those mascots. And now, let us bask in what we have achieved in terms of disrupting this program that holds down Palestinian folks in Palestine and, and our, our communities, communities here, here in this, this country. country. That, that is, is the power that has been mobilized. We have exposed the rift between the Anti-Defamation League's stated mission and its actual practice. So now that we've done that, like my comrade Iran said, it's time to celebrate and escalate. It's time to push hard and end these programs once and for all. And keep in mind the fact, that what, what this proves which is that when we say that when black people get free, everybody gets free, that's not just a slogan, <laughs> but it is true that a black led revolt has, you know, in solidarity with Palestinian struggle has lifted us all up. Let us remember that a conversation and a fight for justice in our communities does not end in our communities. It is a fact that we are bound together and that we rise together and we will get free together. Thank you, Solidarity, and let's keep going. Thank you so much. That is a fact. Thank you so much. Mark Swani, the Executive Director at the Arab Resource and Organizing Center. Um, and from Laura and Arock's work, whether it be running and winning a campaign to challenge the deadly exchange of the Urban Shield Trainings and Weapons Expo, to years of anti-police work and knitting together of cross-movement struggle, to helping to found the Drop the ADL Coalition. I, cannot, I could go on and on all night about the ways that Lara is a powerhouse organizer and has set the scene for every bit of win that is here and all that will come. Lara, I'm so happy to introduce you. So happy to be here and we are a powerhouse movement is what this is about today. We have so many lessons to from this work and from this moment, but first and foremost, let's remember this is a testament to the power of our movements. ADL's decision to switch gears on its shameful police delegations was clearly a tactical response to shield itself from criticism during a particular moment. After all, ADL is not a civil rights organization, it is a pro-Israeli apartheid interest group aimed at undermining efforts in solidarity with Palestine. But more than anything, this was a response to effective organizing, grassroots organizing by actual race, racial justice movements. It's the result of the advances of the movement for black lives and making policing a wedge issue. It's the result of longstanding work of Palestinians fighting back against the violence of, and the violent impacts of Zionism. It's the result of solidarity we built over decades between black, Palestinian, indigenous communities and our anti-Zionist Jewish allies. But let's take a second to ground ourselves of what it means for us to go against, up against these police exchanges. Um, today, we know that we've learned so much 
about the uphill battle anti-policing work is. It's a struggle against structures of racism that are deeply embedded in this world of global capitalism. So to organize to end police exchanges is to fight for new political and economic priorities of this country, away from war making and policing and towards the dignity, health and well-being of all people. It's a fight that links us to struggles for freedom of people across the world. We learned early on in our campaign to stop Urban Shield in the San Francisco Bay Area that we can, in fact, disrupt these exchanges and we can, in fact, end them. Urban Shield was the largest regional national global weapons expo in militarization training, took place every year on the weekend of 9-11, bringing Israeli police to train with emergency responders. From 2012 to 2019, our Stop Urban Shield coalition was able to mobilize real people power to demonstrate a real deep commitment to racial justice and internationalism and to win by defunding the racist and violent program. That campaign taught us what is possible through long-term cross-movement building and organizing. This is something everyone, everywhere can do in bigger and more impactful ways through stopping these deadly exchanges. And as ADL continues their exchanges in support of law enforcement, it is all that more important for us today to continue building on our victories and to escalate our organizing. Moving forward, ADL can continue its PR efforts. But let's remind everyone listening today that our organizing efforts will also continue. We will continue to encourage people to think about what the ADL is actually doing and to drop the ADL. ADL's record speaks for itself from their long history of disrupt disrupting social movements to their ongoing alignment with the far right and attacking ethnic studies across the country as we speak. Today, we have an opportunity to help all our allies take anti-racist, bold stances, to educate their bases on Palestine and the anti-apartheid movement, and to help them defend their position against racist backlash. What is possible if we continue to equip ourselves and our allies with the tools necessary to create more wedges between apartheid Israel and progressive movements, to understand the domestic manifestations of white supremacy as inextricably linked to the Zionist colonial project? Can we, for instance, understand Palestinian solidarity as not just a value, but a true call to action? The work to defund police, to end police exchanges, to drop the ADL are examples of joint struggle that continue to inspire us, to inspire us all to shape our visions for what's possible and hopefully to shape how it is we should continue understanding our shared legacies of resistance as a place of hope and possibility for us all. We owe it to our movements who made this win today possible to continue winning. So onwards. Thank you so much. Onwards indeed. And to that end, we are all going to take a little action break right now. We're at a rally. We're going to take some action together. Movements did this. Movements brought this moment. And we will continue forward in the ways that we have been talking about all night. So right now, I want to take a minute and talk to everyone out there who's listening, the hundreds of you who are listening here tonight, um, the Anti-Defamation League tends to be a civil rights organization and is nothing of the sort, as we all know. But I want you to think about a way in your community, the ADL is showing up and pretending at that civil rights representation, but actually disrupting our movements and pursuing an anti-Black, anti-Palestinian I want to point out that in the memo, for folks who have not seen, they actually talk about an option where they would, um, what to do, what to do with this program. They present one option, they'll just rebrand it and call it the Institute for Global Dialogue, right? So the work that they're doing is constantly about branding and rebranding their anti-Palestinian agenda. So they may work with your local school. They may give quotes to your local paper. They may be connected to a local progressive organization you're a part of, you, you're inside of. Think about and write in the chat a place in your organization, in your, in your community, where you see the ADL trading on a civil rights reputation and pursuing this anti-Palestinian agenda that we must stop collectively. And I want to share, you should see on the screen, www.dropTheADL dot org go there now is it dot org or dot com it's in the, it's in the chat it's on the screen go there now you can share those resources with the places in your community that continue to partner with the adl unbeknownst to their actual reputation 
So go there now, do that, report back in the chat. We'll share with each other that work as we continue this movement forward. Um, and in that same vein, now to on the ground, the way that this deadly exchange campaign is going to continue to build, continue to grow, and end all exchanges everywhere. This campaign and this moment has been made up of powerful local coalitions across the country, none more so than the demilitarized Durham to Palestine coalition, which brought about one of the first landmark and the first legislative this campaign years ago in banning this program from the local from the local community through the city and defending that win for multiple years. So happy to go to the ground to talk to demilitarize Durham to Palestine. Hi everyone, my name is Gabriel and I'm a member of JVP Triangle NC. My name is Beth, I'm a member of JVP Triangle NC. I'm Sandra. I'm also a member of Jewish Voice for Peace, Triangle, North Carolina chapter. Hey, y'all. I'm Roxana Vendesu, and I'm part of Migrant Roots Media. We're all part of the Term of Palestine Coalition. Along with a number of other groups, and we uh, wanted to say a little bit about our coming together as a coalition um, back in 2016. Um, after a lot of listening sessions and strategizing, we decided to embark on our version of the deadly exchange campaign to stop, uh, ask our city council to bar Durham police from participating in this in these trainings. Our police chief, our former police chief, had participated in an ADL exchange, and our police chief at the time that we did the campaign, who was new at the time, uh, ran a different type of uh, not with the ADL but other exchanges in Georgia, um, and we. Uh, um, did a lot of work to pressure our city council and uh, educate our community and our, we ended up getting our city council to vote unanimously to end militarized police exchanges um, in Durham. Yay! And it is not a coincidence that our win and um, the anti-surveillance win in New Orleans happened in the south. We are building on histories of of organizing for of relational organizing and of folks in the civil rights movement and the black freedom movement. So many justice movements are rooted in the South. It's a lot of injustice is also rooted, rooted here, but um, we have these relationships that we thank for um, teaching us what we needed to know to win and to band together in solidarity. Um, and we also wanted to point out that this is not the, um, the end of our fight. Um, we know that the Georgia International Law Enforcement Exchange is still taking U.S. Um, law enforcement and ICE border um, and deportation agents to train with Israeli military. Um, and we know that the military industrial complex, these for-profit corporations that profit from um, our people's suffering and from continued occupation in Palestine is trying to expand into our cities. So we're really committed to um, continuing the struggle as a coalition. Our coalition is still organizing. Um, and we're getting ready to launch a new campaign um, specifically targeting the military industrial complex, which we um, are excited to talk about soon. Thank you. And yes, I, I have to mention that as an immigrant and as a person from the global south, uh, we've seen how uh, this type of deadly trainings affect our communities. And uh, it's important to mention that this is happening across the world and we are organizing globally to stop it. So we really need to make that effort to reach out to all the networks that we can work, of course, on the ground at the grassroots level to pass this, uh, this uh, amendments, this uh, resolutions, um, to really counter what's happening uh, and all the things that are causing in, in our different community, the communities. The global war on terror is that, is global, and that's how we need to organize at a global level. Um, and so finally, I will say justice, justice, we will pursue. Yay! Yay! <laughs> justice, justice, we will pursue. Um, thank you all so much. It is so inspiring, I know, to all of us around the, around the, the country and the world to see 
what local organizing does. When we fight, we win. That's true of building our, our national and international coalitions. And it's true of the beautiful work happening at the local level on this campaign in cities all across the country. Thank you, Durham, for leading the way. Um, I'm so excited now to turn to Sandra Tamari, the executive director of Adela Justice Project, um, which itself is an organization and stands for herself are absolute, absolute weavers of Black, Black and Palestinian freedom, freedom movements, movements and, and of all of our intersectional movements for justice. justice. Um, in, in the, the memo, memo, actually, the ADL itself talks about how scared they were of a protest that she led at their headquarters in St. Louis. Um, and and there, there are many, many more uh, trembling <laughs> at the incredible work that our movement is able to do because of the work of the Dalla Justice Project and Sandra. So Sandra, so happy you're here with us. You. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you, JVP, for this invitation and congratulations to our movement. Um, I just want to take a deep breath. I'm feeling a lot of emotion. Um, I didn't prepare formal remarks. I think I want to sort of walk us through some of the history that happened here in St. Louis with the ADL. You know, immediately, ADL was pushing back against Palestinian solidarity with the uprising in Ferguson. In March, with our, with our siblings at the Organization for Black Struggle and with Latin American students at, at Washington University, we put together a really beautiful panel at the Missouri History Museum to explore issues of state violence. We were talking about Ferguson, we were talking about Palestine, we were talking about the massacre of the of the students at, from Ayatzo Napa, the farm school in, in Mexico. The Missouri History Museum censored Palestine and insisted that Palestine be omitted from the program before they would allow it to, to take place there. Because of the work of the local JVP chapter, we were able to access emails because the Missouri History Museum is a public institution, they had to release emails under a FOIA request. And what we saw were uh, conversations between the director of the museum and the ADL regional director, Karen Oresti. And what did Karen offer? Karen Oresti offer to the museum? She said, let us know if you want us to coordinate with the St. Louis police because we were because our coalition was going to hold a protest. So basically, they were the, the facilitators of the police coming to put down our protest at the museum. It didn't stop there. Just days before the one year anniversary of Michael Brown's murder, the ADL of St. Louis offered an award to the St. Louis police with no irony, with no remorse. Continue to see that the ADL sides with state power in every instance. So it's not to come as a surprise to anyone that continued the pattern. We know that they will continue to choose this path. And as Iran said, we choose people. It's our duty as Palestinians to fight for black liberation. And we are so grateful for black organizers who have chosen this anti-colonial struggle as part of their own struggle, because they understand that a world where Palestinians are unfree is a world where black people continue to be subjugated to this terrible state of mind. And as Durham just told us, there's no line between domestic policies and international policies. The police are, are, are simply the groundwork for what happens with our military. The police are simply the way that we kept black people and indigenous people on conquer the continent. They looked immediately forward. And so there's no, no difference in the budget that goes to our police quest and colonial pursuits. The ADL has chosen the side of that colonial, this colonial pursuits. We have said very clearly 
that the ADL belongs in no progressive coalitions. And I hope that this memo makes that very clear to our partners out there, our civil rights partners, the people that are doing work against the police, the people that are doing police reform work. We hope you understand that the ADL is not your friend. Thank you to everyone and onward we go. Thank you so much, Sandra. Um, I am so lucky now to get to Aisha Mansour here in, I'm in Seattle and so is Aisha. And Aisha is a founder of Palestinian, a grassroots Palestinian feminist organization based here in Seattle and a core organizer of the End the Deadly Exchange campaign here in this town. I am so lucky to have get, gotten to work deeply closely in the local fight here and to get to see the way that the, the way that we're talking all night about how our movements come together and build toward collective freedom, collective liberation, and a vision of safety that includes all of us is so embodied by Aisha herself and by the gorgeous work of Palestinian and the End the Deadly Exchange Coalition right here. So I'm so happy to get to, to share the mic. Thank, Thank you, Stephanie. It's such an honor to be with you all today and to be discussing our most recent developments with our campaign to end the deadly exchange in Seattle. Our campaign was launched about three years ago when we learned that multiple Seattle police chiefs and other high ranking officers within the last decade have traveled to Israel to be trained by their armed security forces. Amongst these officers include Chief Carmen Best. In 2016, she spoke at an ADL dinner and said, and I quote, Last year, I had the opportunity to travel to Israel to attend ADL's National Counterterrorism Seminar to study firsthand its tactics and strategies, strategies to combat terrorism. She continued on to explain that she is excited to partner with the ADL Pacific Northwest on additional hate training and anti-bias training for their 21st Century Policing Act. She said that she believes this program would enhance her department's knowledge and understanding of the role that law enforcement plays in Seattle. You most likely know Chief Best as the chief who authorized excessive use of tear gas on protesters after the city had banned its use in 2000 and 2020, who fabricated a false threat of Proud Boys on radio transmitters to scare protesters, the chief who unequivocally stood by her department's actions even after they maced a seven-year-old child in the eyes at point-blank range at a protest. She was chief of the Seattle Police Department when they were sued by Black Lives Matter, and she only resigned after budget cuts impacted her. I tell this story to give you a picture of the Seattle context that we are dealing with. While the 2020 uprisings brought more attention to our campaign, it did not change our analysis. We have always known that policing in the United States is a racist institution that must be defunded and demilitarized. And we have always known that racist nations depend on one another to exchange technology and strategies to maintain the status quo and squash our resistance efforts. As a Palestinian, I have felt firsthand the impacts of military violence from the Israeli state. And I know that it is not in anyone's best interest to be training with them. So in 2021, after another brutal military assault on Gaza and uprisings around Sheikh Jarrah, we officially introduced legislation to Seattle City Council to ban these police trainings. Our campaign was endorsed by over 55 local organizations in Seattle, and every public comment was filled with testimonies from Black, Palestinian, and Jewish community members in support of our legislation. We outnumbered our opposition nine to one during these calls. And it was clear to us that Seattle City Council, it was clear to us and it was clear to Seattle City Council that this was a cut and dry piece of legislation that needed to be passed and that it was widely supported. Our legislation would not only ban trainings with Israel, but it would have banned trainings with any country who had been convicted of violating the most egregious human rights, like genocide, mass rape, and torture. So it came as an utter shock to us when our legislation had failed by one vote. We were confused and we were angry and we were hurt and we needed to know what happened. And so we did some digging and we found that the ADL amongst other Zionist organizations had lobbied against our legislation at every term. 
we learned that the Israeli consular general had flown up to Seattle to fight our legislation. And this memo shows us the truth, right? This memo in combination with our public records request shows us how truly deceitful the ADL is. Not only did they essentially convince our council members to continue to allow the Seattle Police Department to be trained by human rights violators, but they did so at a time when they were simultaneously internally questioning the legitimacy of these exchanges and suggesting that they end them because they may contribute to increased police brutality in the United States. But this memo also makes something very clear to me. The ADL never suggested to end these exchanges because they actually care about police brutality, though they may recognize that they play an integral role in it. They only suggested that they ended these exchanges because it would, and I quote, cost the ADL upward of $200,000 per year in staff time to defend the trips from controversy. The ADL has an agenda, and that agenda is to support the state of Israel no matter what no matter what cost, even if that cost is black and brown lives. So let this be a reminder to us all that our fight is not finished. We are just getting started. We see this as a moment, as a reinvigoration for our campaign. We will never stop fighting to end the deadly exchange in Seattle. We will never stop fighting to demilitarize our police. And we will never allow the ADL to claim progressiveness. But we need your support and we need people power and we need unity. If you would like more information about our campaign in Seattle, please follow us on at NDX Seattle. That's NDX Seattle on Instagram and Twitter. And we'll be posting updates as we move forward. Thank you for having me here. It's been an honor to be featured on a panel with such like amazing organizers. Thank you so much, Aisha. Yes, yes, yes. The continue um and shout out to your dad in the chat as well who is <laughs> well this is a, a multi-generational movement may we make our children proud may we make our parents proud may we continue to fight for each other right um so beautiful so beautiful to be here tonight we are one big movement family um i want to take us to one last action break you guys so if um, if you are perhaps in Durham or Seattle, you know right where to where to hook up with the incredible local organizing we've gotten to talk about here tonight. But there is so much more and there needs to be so much more happening in every single city across the country and, and campuses too. We've had amazing, amazing victories at Northeastern, at Tufts. Um, there are many more to come. And so let your city, let your campus be next. In the chat, you should see a registration link for a March 29th workshop where we are going to get all in to how you can take this campaign to your city. You can be, you can build the kinds of coalitions we're getting to hear about on the ground tonight um, and make it happen in your city. So we are going to wipe these exchanges out every city across the country. So join us at that, reg register now, join us at that workshop. That'll take you through everything you need to know to bring your community together and end this exchange today. Um, so I'm gonna take a minute's breath to allow you to go ahead and register there. Um, and then next up, I am so pleased to introduce Ashley Woodard Henderson who has held many positions of leadership at critical movement organizations and is the first and current executive director at the incredible and esteemed um, Highlander Research and Education Center, um, and is also an active leader and participant in, within the movement for Black Lives. Simply put, this win does not exist as we've been talking about all night without the world shifting work of the movement for Black Lives. And Ashley is a visionary and organizer's organizer. And I know we're talking about movements here tonight, but I must say that she herself has helped to forge so many corners of the united front that led to this moment. And so for that reason, it is so wonderful to get to say, Ashley, thanks so much for being here. Dean, can we just take a moment, just take one moment and revel in this truth that when we come together across our differences, we make impossible things possible. Y'all will remember with me that even just a few months ago, 
folks told us that the Degley Exchange campaign was a pipe dream, that there was no way that we would ever shake the ADL, right? Remember when people told us that they were untouchable, that the consequences of organizing around their intentional, overt destruction of our communities was nothing more than asking to be kicked in the teeth by Zionists. Remember when they told us to be discouraged and to not come together across our differences to say that enough was enough. Do you remember? Do you remember all of the times that you maybe gave up a little bit of hope in the potential of, of ending these exchanges because it just seemed like too much money, too much power concentrated in one organization that was gaslighting us by telling everyone that was around us that they believed in the civil rights of black people and all people while they were literally actively denying the civil rights and human rights of all people. Do you remember that? Remember how it felt in your body? Remember how it felt in your heart? Remember what it did to your gut? How fuzzy and confusing it might have made your brain? And then I want you to remember the moment where you found out that all of the work that you had been doing, that your communities had been doing, that your organization had been doing, that your colleagues and comrades across this country and the world had been doing in relationship to the deadly exchange campaign. Remember the moment when you found out that there was a memo that said that the work that you had done had been impactful. What did it do for your spirit when all of the lies that you had been told about what was impossible, what you couldn't do, what we didn't deserve, was proven mythological, was proven to be a lie? So I just wanna take a moment with you comrades to revel and affirm how good it feels to know that the work that we have been doing, the sacrifices that we have been making have not been in vain. And then I wanna push us. As my comrade Montega Simmons said, it is only cold comfort to know that they have paused the program. We didn't fight for a pause, right? If what, if what what we say right now is that this is a total victory, then they will say we gave you what you wanted and be confused when we're pushing for even more transformative justice. A pause is excellent. And we did that. No question. Because they wouldn't do anything just to be in good people. Let's be clear. Right. And let's be clear that the ADL is not just a, 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 a bricks and mortar place. Right. These are humans with names and addresses that are literally consolidating their wealth and power at the expense of Palestinian and black people. Right. So let's be clear. We did that. The pause exists because of us. And yet there is work to be done. When my comrades on this call tonight have said we need to escalate it's because that work is not finished. It is not complete. This program needs to be abolished, period. There should be no exchanges. And frankly, when we said defund the police, we meant that shit. <laughs> we still mean it. It is the beginning of the sentence, though, because we also believe that now is the time for repair. Now is the time for reparations. Now is the time for reinvestment, to take all of these resources that are funding these failed systems that are at our expense to reinvest those dollars into building healthy, sustainable, and equitable communities across this globe. That is the work to be done, good people. Now is the time to make sure that our allies who have been working and partnering with the ADL because it was good for business to be held accountable as well. It is time for them to cut the cord, to drop the ADL. We need to be clear that there are many many, many, many lessons to be learned in this moment. The lesson of centering the voices of the directly impacted as the most winning strategical intervention that could be made. When we centered the voices of Palestinian people, when we centered the voices of black people, when we centered the voices of working class folks that were being impacted by terrorist police, what we saw was an ex exceedingly and abundantly vibrant movement that could come together and sustain relationships in ways that transformed contemporary realities. Directly impacted people leading in the charge gets the goods, good people. 
What we also learned is that to get what we want to make the impossible things possible will require us to build multi-tactical, multi-ideological spaces with multi-methodological interventions, multi-tactical strategies to get to where we are now. Now it is our work and our duty to sustain the stamina of that united front, to continue to apply pressure where we see fit, as we see fit, as directed by directly impacted people. Now is the time to remember that when they tell us that things are impossible, they are lying. And that we should be demanding what we deserve, not just what we would concede to. Now is the time to remember that power concedes nothing and the ADL conceded nothing without an organized demand and a consequence. You heard my colleagues earlier saying not only did we have an organized demand, but they they were facing the consequence of what how much it was going to cost to have to continue to deal with us. Right? We should continue to make those consequences real and we should continue to demand what we deserve. What we know is that internationalism works. What we know is that now is not the time to back down, but to escalate because none of us are free until all of us are free. And right now, as we are tearing down this old dilapidated world that has done us no good, now is the time for us to be building alternatives. Now is the time for us to be fighting for the vision for black lives. Now is the time for us to be supporting the demands of the BDS movement. Now is the time for us to continue the incredible generations long work of our people. Now is our time. We should be building alternatives, reimagining what safety looks like, disarming and decriminalizing all of these things. Now is our moment, good people. So I'm going to invite you to, again, just remember how it felt when you realized that the thing that they told us was impossible had become possible because of our relationships, because of our sacrifices, because of our work. And I want you to think about how you're going to apply that good juju, that good feeling, the, the truth that we can win to all things that we do next together. Solidarity, good people. We love you. Emotional. <laughs> Ashley, um, thank you so, so much. Yes. Amen. Um, and now to close us out, we'll hear from Iran once more at the end about how we all move forward together. Um, but I, I have an opportunity here to introduce Linda Sarsour, who needs no introduction, a Palestinian Muslim American and a self-proclaimed pure New Yorker born and raised in Brooklyn. Um, she founded Empowered Change, which as an organization has been a key essential partner in building this campaign from day one. And Linda herself embodies with her every breath that fight for an end to racist militarized policing and that vision of collective safety and liberation from Ferguson to Louisville to Brooklyn to Palestine. Linda, I'm so happy you're here to close this out. Um, welcome. I am so happy to be here. I'm so sorry that I just jumped because I was um, training 40 incredible Muslim organizers um, in a master class series that every Monday night. Uh, and so, so just more, more comrades out there ready to fight with us. I just came to confirm what I've always known about JVP and your incredible consistent organizing. You stand your ground and how you move. Um, that is what you do and that is who you are. And that's he was with the Muslims. You have been with us and at least Personally, for me, I've watched JVP uh, stand unequivocally in solidarity with their Muslim and Palestinian uh, neighbors um, since the horrific attacks of 9-11. Um, and that was a very long time ago. And so I just want to always reaffirm and remind you all of that um, and the incredible organization that you all are a part of and support. And anytime I have the opportunity to uh, reaffirm um, that we should not be working with the ADL, nobody in our movement should be working with the ADL that opportunity. Um, I, I am waiting for the day where um, mo movement organizations from C to Shang C uh, heed the call of Palestinian organizers and Muslim organizers, organizers to cease and desist from their relationship to the ADL until there's some sort of transformative process. I mean, I want to be true to who I am by saying that if there are people willing to go through a transformative process that centers 
the most marginalized and the most harmed uh, by the ADL, their community, and I say that in the spirit of Nelson Mandela and Dr. Martin Luther King, the ADL is an organization that has uh, harmed people. Um, they have, me personally, they have harmed Muslim American organizers. They have targeted powerful women of color, Muslim women in Congress. I mean, these are two Muslim women that made history for our community and have had to deal with um, that has come from, uh, you know, oftentimes from Jonathan Greenblatt himself, who seems to have um, double standards in the way in which he addresses Muslim women and powerful Muslim women that he does of engaging in. And so, and so I hope that this is a period in our um, history where people can look back and say that we stood in solidarity, that we held an organization that is very powerful, um, accountable um, in the ways in which they show up in our movements. And so I am proud to know that for three years, the deadly exchange program was stopped in its tracks. And, it, and, and, and to be even more clear, that it was because of the organizing of our movement. It was because of JVP, it was because of black organizers. It was because of Palestinian organizers and those who are in allyship and solidarity with us. Um, and so I'm not gonna lie to you in this dark time that we live in, that was a bit of light. Um, I wish that uh, the ADL had really um, reflected even deeper um, and realized that there should never be any options, that the only option is to cease and desist these programs. Um, especially in light of the powerful Black-led organizing we have seen um, in the last, you know, minimum of 10 years that has shined the light on the systemic racism of our policing in America. And there should never be an organization that is part of our movements that calls itself a civil rights organization that is awarding police chiefs, that is a uh, 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 type of... Uh, partnership with law enforcement that does not center the communities that are harmed by it, and, and also organizations that are not willing to even have a conversation about defunding police, um, and really allocating those resources back to the communities they claim to care about. The fact that the these these uh, campaigns were costing around $315,000 for, for just one junket because it's $115,000 plus $200,000 dollars for their staff time, imagine what a $300,000 investment would put back into the movements um, and the many communities that are harmed and impact by policing in America. So I'm here to say congratulations. I'm here to say and, and to keep going. Um, and I look forward to as many of you as possible who are able to show up with us tomorrow at six o'clock, we'll be meeting uh, near Bryant Park and then marching over to the ADL because we need them to hear and to say we're on to you. Um, you know, we're, we, we, we will hold you accountable or at the very least, we will ask our friends um, to be in solidarity with us and cease relationships until you figure out how to address the harm that you made. So thank you, JVP. Thank you to um, all of you for being here today. Oof, thank you, Linda, as always. Are you fired up already? Are we ready to go? I'm ready to go. Man, we have had more activists from the ground and other speakers that want to be with us live. I couldn't make it because the late hour in Palestine, some tech issues. Mm -hmm. Look out on our different social platforms, more powerful speeches, videos from Noura Arikat, who shares our love uh, and power to us all and more speakers that are gonna come up in the next few days on our social. Okay, so after we heard from all those incredible leaders, are we ready to escalate? This week, we start a series of actions from NYC, the one that Linda just talked about it tomorrow evening, from NYC to Seattle, across the country, the 29th, if you didn't register yet, there's still time at 8 p.m. Eastern, and then on April 8th, at 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 Pacific, we are hosting an incredibly important Drop the ADL educational webinar that you won't want to miss with Robin Kelly, Laura Kiswani, Amaya Gelman, Leslie Williams. They are going to talk with us about the ways the ADL has since its inception, right, undermined racial and social justice movement and communities and how we can participate in Drop the ADL, actually dropping the ADL, organizing in our schools 
in our communities. Make sure to look out for registration page for that event. You want to be there. Throughout this week, during Israeli Apartheid Week, us campuses, we are holding lectures on different campuses. The next one is tomorrow, hosted by Boston University at 6 p.m. Um, Eastern. And so if you are in Boston, get to a bus to NYC and participate in the protest in NYC. But if you're sticking around anyway and you want to learn more about the campaign, the next one is Boston. Join us on Zoom tomorrow. And in the next several weeks and months, we have a national escalation plan for everyone, including bringing local legislation to cities and states across the country and tailored workshops on how to push this legislation forward. Together, we will ban not only the ADL trips, but end all police delegations and exchanges with Israel. We chose the people. This is how we win. Thank you all for being with us this evening. See you on the streets, see you online. We're not going to stop. We're just beginning. Celebrate and escalate.